You are listening to The Underground Subway with host David Alston, a podcast dedicated to giving you the strategies to live a free and better life. Here is David Alston. Hi, I'm David Alston, and welcome to The Underground Subway, a podcast that is dedicated to one thing, and that's giving you the tools and strategies that are needed in life for all of us to live a better, more productive, and more successful life. Listen, my friends, one of the quotes that Harriet Tubman made that I am so fond of, she said that I could have freed so many more slaves if only they knew that they were slaves. People were living in bondage. People were living in chains. People were living far beneath their potential in life, and they didn't know it. How many of us are living a life in which we have things holding us back, and we don't know it? How many of us are living a life in which we have chains, and we don't know it? Listen, the underground subway is sort of like that GPS system in which the GPS system will tell you where you are. It will tell you, you have to tell it where you want to go. But then once you tell the GPS system where you want to go, the GPS system will then tell you how long it takes to get there. It will tell you what roads you need to take. You have to make the choice. Do I take the shorter route that is going to cost me more or do I take the long way there if it's going to be easy? Then after all of that is said and done, you, not the GPS system, but you are the one that have to hit the go button. Once you hit the go button, the GPS system will tell you how to get there. That's what this podcast is. It's a GPS system because we are going to reveal to you some strategies by way of quality and qualified guests that are here to tell you how to get to your destination. But it's up to you to put it into action. I'm excited about the Underground Subway. I'm excited about this edition, and I thank you for joining us for this edition of the Underground Subway. I want to introduce my guest, who I am extremely excited to talk to about a better life. Our guest is Mike Forrester. Let me share with you some information about our guest, Mike Forrester. Mike Forrester is a men's transformation coach, founder of the Living Fearless Coaching Programs, and host of the Living Fearless Today podcast. His decades of experience with overcoming failures, setbacks, and struggles fuels his clients to overcome their own self-doubt. With his personal journey through overcoming childhood trauma, dyslexia, and loss of loved ones, Mike is determined to set the example to not allow excuses to derail you. His podcast, Living Fearless Today, focuses on helping men overcome fear, anxiety, and depression by highlighting success stories of those who have lived through it. His insights, methods, and stories of building post-traumatic growth have been featured on various podcasts, including Hanging On to Hope, Extreme Health, Own Your Life, Own Your Career, and Think Unbroken. And now I'm excited that his story will be shared on the Underground Subway. Before I introduce my guests, I must give a disclaimer. So many guests have come on the Underground Subway, and after introducing them, they all most of them say the same thing. They will say, thank you, and it's a pleasure being on the Underground Subway. And then most of them, especially the ladies, will always say, David, I just love your voice. You have a voice for radio. You have a voice for a podcast. Let me introduce to you Mike Forrester, who makes my voice sound like Mickey Mouse. He has a voice (laughs) that is made for Hollywood. Welcome to the Underground Subway, Mike Forrester. Thank you, my friend, for joining us. David, thank you so much (laughs) on so many levels, my friend. (laughs) Oh, man, I am so honored and uh, just excited to be here and, and talk with you, David. And we've already had a great conversation prior to this. So, yeah, looking forward to uh, to our time together, my friend. Let's jump right into it. Part of your bio talks about uh, your childhood trauma and how you use that to to become who you are today. Talk to us a little bit about your childhood trauma and and how does it, in your opinion, once you you know, I want you to talk about your tra- childhood trauma, but then I want you to share with us how we can take our tra- childhood trauma because I had it. I've written about it. I've expressed it. I've talked about it. And how do we take that and use that uh, to grow personally and professionally? 
Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So my childhood trauma was in all three capacities as far as mental, emotional, and physical. Um, and is with my parents. And before we jump into stuff, I want it understood. They did the best with who they were and what they had, just as you and I, you know, we're doing the best with who we are and, and our intentions don't always line up with our actions. Um, man, David, it, it was one, they did their best. Now, innocently, they would say, you know, Hey, you were a mistake, you know, um, you're not going to, you know, amount to things. And man, we got onto the physical side. You know, I've got scars from altercations, fights with my parents, but uh, dude, it's one that they did the best, right? It, the way I received it and went through with stuff put me on a trajectory, David, where it was like I was destructive in my marriage, my relationship with my children. And so what I experienced, I then passed on in, you know, in my adult life in those roles. Now, as far as what I experienced, like I said, there was, you know, stuff where my parents were saying things. Um, having dyslexia was also one of those. I wasn't diagnosed till I was 40, David. So I just mm -hmm. felt like I was special, but not mm -hmm. that good kind of special. I mm -hmm. was special as in like, what is wrong with me? And why am I standing out in a negative way? And um, that just became something that was another reason with my parents, you know, as far as, um, you know, looking stupid in school, which just gave them fuel for, um, you know, like the, the things that they would say. And so I grew up thinking, hey, I'm stupid. I don't matter. I have no worth. Um, you know, there's no reason for me to be here. Right. I didn't understand my purpose, my value, my significance didn't have that confidence. I was very much in my own prison because I bought into those beliefs. So I had a victim mindset. And just as you talked about, you know, not understanding I'm in chains and I built a, a great chain link, you know, to just encase me and um, used that. I was very much like Eeyore, you know, if you think of Winnie the Pooh and just mm -hmm. kind of being downtrodden and looking at the world is woe. Um, but man, David, I also mixed it up with the Hulk. And so carry that out. You know, I felt like I was a victim, but I was mad about it. And so the worst thing was to, you know, be around me when I was upset because you didn't know what was going to be destroyed. And so the manipulation that I went through and experienced, I turned around and took that. The things that I experienced and was taught by my mom and dad were the exact things how I behaved, how I tried to control my world around me. And uh, man, you can imagine it is not healthy. It doesn't create a very secure, loving, um, you know, in environment, less, much less a family. And so those things all brought me at one point very close to being divorced and distanced from my children. You know, you you you're talking about your your experiences and how you talk about your parents and how they uh, raised you, and you started off by saying they did the best they could, which lets us know that it's not just negative intentions. Some people just don't know, or they think they're doing the right thing. But then uh, there's this. There's always been this debate in life, uh, you know, Mike, about nature versus nurture. And when we deal with the, the nurture part of the training part, it's a part of who we are because it's a part of how we're influenced. When we're influenced in a certain way, sort of like you were, uh, talk to us about that cycle. Because if um, I remember, I remember when I moved out on my own, the first thing I did when I went into my first apartment, I'll never forget, I went into my apartment and before I decorated or hung a curtain or Un unpack the box. I took a rag and I stuck it under the sink, under the bathroom sink, under the little pipe under the sink. And I never knew why I did it until later on. I realized I did it because that's the way my mom had always done it. She'd always had a rag under the sink mm -hmm. to clean the bathroom. I didn't know why the rag was there. I did it because it's what I saw. Talk to us about how we can break that cycle 
of the unhealthy patterns that we experience in our childhood so that it, it doesn't continue to cycle to the next generation and the generation after that. Absolutely. So let me just ask you, do you like steak? Love it. <laughs> How appealing does a, a steak that has been inside of a freezer for five years sound? Does that sound like something you'd want for dinner? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, the reason I ask those questions is I want to set the stage for something that was a safety mechanism because of what I experienced. In growing up, David, as a way for my mother to control the environment, the situation, and because, um, you know, limited budget, they would take a chain wrap it around the fridge and lock it. And so neither my brother nor I had access to the fridge without our parents, you know, allowing us in to get food. And so from that, I carried it into, you know, when I had my family, I bought like a big freezer, you know, like you'd go to Best Buy or any kind of big box store and you see these nice big freezers that, you know, hold a lot of food. David, in my desire, to have food and feel secure i filled it up with a ton of meat but the problem was david i was so insecure that i couldn't eat the food and so when we had a power outage five years later it was you know i discovered hey this food is all burned you know from from being in the freezer i wouldn't want to eat it if i had to because the taste of what you would get when you got a freezer, you know, or excuse me, when you got a steak from the store versus a steak that's five years later, doesn't have the same taste. It's got a whole lot of funk mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it may still have the nutrition, but it doesn't have that same taste that you would expect with something that's fresh. And so my connection to having food overrode the logic of you know, how long to store things, that kind of situation is one of many that will play out for us where, you know, an experience will drive us to have a certain reaction, a certain expectation and perspective. Unless we realize those, we're seeing things and acting almost unconsciously um, to them. And so another one was, David, at one point, I didn't have money to pay my bills. And so when the utility companies would come up to check the meters, I mean, it's an innocent thing. They're just looking to see how much electricity did you did you use? Mm -hmm. David, I would freak. I would panic and just go, oh, my gosh, they're here to shut off the power. And I would run downstairs and look on the computer. Am I late? Can I pay the bill? David, that kind of stuff happens because of of, you know events that have occurred when the mm -hmm. power did get shut off and so there's almost this um, domino effect that occurs you know i see a utility truck that means they're here to shut off the power i need to panic and go pay the bill and david this was even years later when i did have the money and was paying things on time to the point where it's like hey first of the month you know you pay the mortgage you pay the bills and those actions were being taken. But if, when I saw the person coming to read the meter, that, that fear would still pop up. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's becoming aware of our actions and what's driving them to then experience that freedom and say, okay, this, this is not what I want to do. How do I disconnect from, from this emotion that was created you know, by this event that occurred. Mm -hmm. When did you have that um, wake up moment that you said, okay, this is it. I'm just going to stop because you mentioned uh, a while ago about some things that happened in your, how your marriage almost ended. When did you have that wake up, that moment where you just sort of snapped? <laughs> I would love to tell you it was early, <laughs> but I'm a little stubborn and dense. So um, honestly, I was late thirties. Um, my kids were, you know, in their teens 
And so they had been trained how to expect me to react. And I had gone through experiences where, you know, I'm trying to manipulate them in forgiving me and giving me additional chances. And so I had stuff I had to work through in my relationship with them, even when I begin to genuinely heal and bring about that change, right? Because they've been trained to expect, you know, this mountaintop experience where, you know, dad will change for a short time and then it's right back to the way he was. Well, when it came about and it was longer term, they still needed to, to see those changes over mm -hmm. the long term to reestablish that trust of, okay, this is new dad. How long is this going to last? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was, it was in my late thirties, but it, it still took time to change the family, family dynamics. You know, mm -hmm. um, when you've broken that trust multiple times, it's not built up just, you know, at the snap of a finger, it's, it's going to take some time and, and, uh, you know, grace to give those around you to, uh, you know, let them see that yes, things have changed and you are now trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So why did you, why did you, um, you, you mentioned in, in the, your bio, it talks about some of the things that you're doing and, and you talk about your trauma, you talked about just now about the children and how, uh, you know, it's a process during your experiences, right? You, whether before you snapped into this good mindset, um, oftentimes when we are faced with trouble, especially as men, because as men, we don't like to talk. Women will, they'll open up and they'll talk to one another. But as men, we tend to appear to be macho or what have you. And we don't talk. But oftentimes, don't you think, Mike, that that can lead us into uh, moments of depression and anxiety. And if, if that's the case, how do we uh, avoid that? How do we avoid slipping into depression and having anxiety when as men, we, we, we suffer in silence? Well, that, that is, oh man, that is a question that yes, I fully uh, can appreciate. I've experienced that anxiety and depression and just to back this up with statistics, David, if you look at depression, you will find out that the women have a higher percentage of depression than the men. It doesn't men mean that as men were not depressed, you can then carry it from there to look at the number of suicides. We as men are three to four times more likely to commit suicide than the women. So what's going on is we are suffering in silence going, I don't feel that anybody wants to hear what I have to say, nor am I allowed as a guy because of like social stigma to speak out what's going on. I'm supposed to buck up and just move through. And uh, so we have this suffering in silence that occurs and uh, it takes us to that ultimate decision. And so having a place where you feel secure and understood to speak what's going on is just foundational. And part of my problem was I thought I was the only one, David. Like mm -hmm. I would have looked at you and said, David's got it all together, man. He is not going to understand that I am struggling, that I feel imperfect, that I've gone through these things. And so I didn't speak about it or look for something else because I didn't think that there was hope. I thought I was the only one and I was flawed and broken. You know, it's like, what's wrong with me? Um, it wasn't until I got to a point where I just said, I'm seeing everybody else have an amazing life and mine sucks. And I got tired of that, David. And I, I went to this point that the pain of not looking the fool as though I had failed because I was brought up being told if you ask questions or you fail, that makes you a failure. Mm -hmm. The pain from, you know, that kind of a perspective had diminished over the, the idea of, I'm so tired of this life that just is filled with pain that I went and started asking guys at work, hey, what are you doing different? Like, 
how are you experiencing this life? Because yours is so much better than mine. And that was really the first catalyst, what started things moving. Because until that point, it was just sit there, shut up, let life be the way it is and do the best with what you can. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and once we move beyond the perspective that I have to endure this in silence and that there's no other hope. If my life has been bad, it's always going to be bad, which that is absolutely false. It's just that we've gotten into a place that we need help getting out of. You know, what we've been doing isn't going to get us to where we want to go. And uh, once we as guys begin to talk and you're starting to see that, you know, within, um, you know, men's mental health, as as we're starting to discuss these things and realize we're not the only ones, you're starting to see things change, men heal, step into a position where, you know, they're they're experiencing that amazing marriage. They're having strong, secure relationships with their children. They're experiencing success at work because they're not looking at the fact of everybody's a threat to me. I can't step into this or they're playing small. You know, life absolutely changes when, when we start healing ourselves and uh, allowing that to come about. So it's, it's often a matter of just reaching out because of how much pain we're in before we decide there's no other route. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. That's very powerful. Uh, you know, Mike, most people, when they overcome traumatic experiences, such as you were, did, they in, turn, they, they, in turn, they began to mentor others and coach others and lead others um, by becoming a life coach or something like that. Uh, why did you in particular become a men's coach, not a quote unquote life coach to everyone? Why did you place your emphasis on being a men's coach? And then in turn, talk to us about why did you, after that, launch the, the, the Living Fearless Today podcast? Um, it wasn't because I was eager to do it. <laughs> it was because I mean... I, David, I struggled with my identity, with who I was and what my worth is. Those messages still are things that I work through because it's like you're you're still going, nope, I don't believe that. That's not the truth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so launching the podcast put me in the view, you know, in in the uh, uh, being seen by my friends and family who would experience me in one way. And giving them the opportunity to say, man, I know you, that's not you. What the heck? Come on. Um, you know, to be shot down in essence, because sometimes friends and family can be the most hurtful ones, right? They, right. Exactly. they expect you to almost play a role. So if you think about going to a play, right, we're going to see Les Mis or Cats or something like that we play a certain role in that cast. And when we step out and we're not, you know, in alignment with, with like that identity, it causes problems with the people around us. And they're then point put at the point, do I want to change because, you know, Mike has changed or David has changed. It puts them in an awkward place. And so if they're not at that point of wanting their own healing, then they can take shots at you. Mm -hmm. So as what drove me into this, or, you know, almost it was one of those, David, that I'm looking at my children and I'm going, man, if I can experience the relationship with my children as they're adults and they've not thrown me aside and, you know, now instead I'm getting to live an amazing life with them and having that relationship that I'd always wanted. And I'm living that vibrant, intimate marriage with my wife. It's like, dude, if where I was, I can get to this place. Then I want to absolutely make sure that other men know that this is available to them. And what we've always wanted, you know, we can step into it. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason for coming into the coaching and, 
and having the podcast and, and stepping out of the shadows. The reason I did this with, you know, with men as, you know, my audience who I'm speaking to and helping and coaching is because I struggled in that identity, right? I know what I went through. Can I empathize with what my wife went through? Absolutely. But I've not walked in what she went through. I can only empathize. And so I understand when a man comes to me and says, hey, this is where I'm at. These are my struggles. I get it. I don't have to sit there and go, well, if I was married to you, what would that feel like? Mm -hmm. No, I have firsthand experience. And that's always the the path of least resistance you know it's like you're more sympathetic you're able to step into it and understand the struggle and the journey to be able to give um support and encouragement uh you know to that kind of situation and so that's where um you know for men that's that's why i'm i'm there to help men does that mean that I don't understand that women have their own struggles. Absolutely not. I mean, there's different struggles and we process it differently, but you know, it's like, where do I feel called to? It's called to support men because I understand what it is as a husband, a father, uh, you know, and a grandfather. So I understand those things um, a lot better than I would if it's like, Hey, what's it like to be a mom or a wife? I don't get that. I can Right. kind of try to understand but i've not walked in those shoes so right so what is what do you think oh in, in your years of experience with your years of experience what do you think is the number one consensual issue that most men or struggle that most men deal with i would say that it's like not understanding our purpose which then gives us a problem as far as like our worth, our confidence, our significance. When we understand what we're gifted with, what we're called to do, almost like what our North Star is, it will help us to be able to endure what's before us and to put in the work to get the results that we want. Because, you know, you talked about a GPS earlier. If you and I are heading out from Los Angeles and we're just, you know, going in a car ride, we get five hours down the road. David, you and I don't know if it's five and a half hours or 15 hours. If it's five and a half, man, let's push through. If it's 15, you and I may be looking for a meal or, you know, some water or, you know, depending upon the time, let's get out and rest. So when we're clear, on where we're going and why we're going there. You know, we can, we can say, I need to put in this much effort and this is what I'm going to be enduring. And you can get further faster, but you also are able to understand what the journey is going to look like. It's not just ethereal. It's not a black box. Well, Mike, there's an old, expression that says time really flies when you're having fun and time has really flown by i have one final question that i would like to ask you and that is would you mind coming back in the future and joining the underground subway david i would be honored thank you my friend all right you heard him world <laughs> you heard him well my friend i would like to thank you again for joining us uh, for the Underground Subway. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to join us and to drop some of your wisdom and knowledge and your struggles and how you turned them into success. And you've inspired us to do the same. And hopefully we can continue this discussion. And I'm sure we're going to gain so much from it. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Well. David, thank you for, for inviting me to join you and just, you know, the great questions you've asked as well. So look forward to coming back and, and sharing more and encouraging others because it's like, we're not in this alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, when we do it together, we can go further. Yeah. We can know that we're encouraged and just, you know, like we talked about endure more. So I appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. 
before you go, tell us how we can get in touch with you, how we can get our hands on any material that you have, and certainly how we can listen to that podcast. Well, I appreciate it. So, David, the best way to get in touch with me is through the website, highcoachmike.com. So that's H-I-C-O-A-C-H-M-I-K-E dot com. And uh, you can schedule a call if you're like, hey, I want some help. I feel like I'm stuck. Calls are honestly the best way to, to just get that stuff out in the air and to figure out what it is you're wanting and where you're at. Um, the podcast is also there. And if social media is the better way for you to connect, those links are also there as well. So the, the best way to get in touch with me to listen to podcast or social media, schedule a call is highcoachmike.com. Well, thanks again, Mike. Well, I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us on the Underground Subway. I want to give another special thank you to our special guest, Mike Forrester. This was a powerful podcast, a powerful edition. I want to thank everyone who have taken time out of their schedule to listen to this edition of the Underground Subway. I don't take it for granted that Mike Forrester joined us, and I don't take it for granted that you joined us to listen to the Underground Subway. Whether you're listening on the treadmill in the gym or whether you're at work listening with your AirPods or whether you're just at home or whether you're in the car listening on your way to work or home from work, wherever you're listening, I want to thank you personally for taking time out to listen to this powerful interview with Mike Forrester. Listen, my friends, there's an old commercial that says life comes at you fast. Well, with special guests like Mike Forrester showing us that there is a better way, there is hope. I want to challenge you to get in touch with him. I want to challenge you to talk to someone. Do not suffer in silence like Mike talked about. There's always hope. There's always help. And I believe that special individuals such as Mike Forrester came across our pathway so that we can know that there is hope, that there is help out there. Listen, I hear the music playing, which means that this train is pulling into the subway station, which means we're nearing the end of this edition of the Underground Subway. We're about to pull into your stop, which is Success Boulevard and Purpose Avenue. And you may have to get off this train today, but there's another train coming real soon that you can hop back on and you can learn and listen to and find all the strategies needed to live a better life. Listen, my friends, before you go to bed tonight, I want to challenge you before you close your eyes for tonight. I want to challenge you to find a mirror and I want you to look yourself right in the eyes and I want you to stare at yourself and I want you to ask yourself a special question. I want you to ask yourself this question as you look at yourself today. Did I do something to work toward my purpose in life? Did I do something to make this world a better place? Or did I simply waste another day? Think about that. You've got no more time to waste. I'm David Austin, host of the Underground Subway, and I want to dare you to have a great day today and a better day tomorrow. We'll see you next time right here on the Underground Subway. <laughs>